chapter 12, Asking to Give. Based on Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. Christ was continually receiving from the Father that he might communicate to us. The word which ye hear, he said, is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. John 14, 24. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Matthew 20, verse 28. Not for himself, but for others he lived and thought and prayed. From hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumbers, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. His words were given him fresh from the heavenly courts, words that he might speak in season to the weary and oppressed. The Lord God hath given me, he said, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Isaiah 50, verse 4. Christ's disciples were much impressed by his prayers and by his habit of communion with God. One day after a short absence from their Lord, they found him absorbed in supplication. Seeming unconscious of their presence, he continued praying aloud. The hearts of the disciples were deeply moved. As he ceased praying, they exclaimed, Lord, teach us to pray. In answer, Christ repeated the Lord's Prayer, as he had given it in the Sermon on the Mount. Then, in a parable, he illustrated the lesson he desired to teach them. Which of you, he said, shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Here Christ represents the petitioner as asking that he may give again. He must obtain the bread, else he cannot supply the necessities of a weary, belated wayfarer. Though his neighbor is unwilling to be troubled, he will not desist his pleading. His friend must be relieved, and at last his importunity is rewarded. His wants are supplied. In like manner, the disciples were to seek blessings from God. In the feeding of the multitude and in the sermon on the bread from heaven, Christ had opened to them their work as his representatives. They were to give the bread of life to the people. He who had appointed their work saw how often their faith would be tried. Often they would be thrown into unexpected positions and would realize their human insufficiency. Souls that were hungering for the bread of life would come to them, and they would feel themselves to be destitute and helpless. They must receive spiritual food, or they would have nothing to impart. But they were not to turn one soul away unfed. Christ directs them to the source of supply. The man whose friend came to him for entertainment, even at the unseasonable hour of midnight, did not turn him away. He had nothing to set before him, but he went to one who had food and pressed his request until the neighbor supplied his need. And would not God, who had sent his servants to feed the hungry, supply their need for his own work? But the selfish neighbor in the parable does not represent the character of God. The lesson is drawn not by comparison, but by contrast. A selfish man will grant an urgent request in order to rid himself of one who disturbs his rest. But God delights to give. He is full of compassion, and he longs to grant the requests of those who come unto him in faith. He gives to us that we may minister to others and thus become like himself. Christ declares, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. The Savior continues, 
If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? In order to strengthen our confidence in God, Christ teaches us to address him by a new name, a name entwined with the dearest associations of the human heart. He gives us the privilege of calling the infinite God our Father. This name, spoken to him and of him, is a sign of our love and trust toward him and a pledge of his regard and relationship to us. Spoken when asking his favor or blessing, it is as music in his ears that we might not think it presumption to call him by this name. He has repeated it again and again. He desires us to become familiar with the appellation. God regards us as his children. He has redeemed us out of the careless world and has chosen us to become members of the royal family, sons and daughters of the heavenly king. He invites us to trust in Him with a trust deeper and stronger than that of a child in His earthly father. Parents love their children, but the love of God is larger, broader, deeper than human love can possibly be. It is immeasurable. Then, if earthly parents know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more shall our Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Christ's lessons in regard to prayer should be carefully considered. There is a divine science in prayer, and his illustration brings to view principles that all need to understand. He shows what is the true spirit of prayer. He teaches the necessity of perseverance in presenting our requests to God and assures us of his willingness to hear and answer prayer. Our prayers are not to be a selfish asking, merely for our own benefit. We are to ask that we may give. The principle of Christ's life must be the principle of our lives. For their sakes, he said, speaking of his disciples, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified. John seventeen nineteen. The same devotion, the same self-sacrifice, the same subjection to the claims of the word of God that were manifest in Christ must be seen in his servants. Our mission to the world is not to serve or please ourselves. We are to glorify God by cooperating with him to save sinners. We are to ask blessings from God that we may communicate to others. The capacity for receiving is preserved only by imparting. We cannot continue to receive heavenly treasure without communicating to those around us. In the parable, the petitioner was again and again repulsed, but he did not relinquish his purpose. So our prayers do not always seem to receive an immediate answer, but Christ teaches that we should not cease to pray. Prayer is not to work any change in God. It is to bring us into harmony with God. When we make request of Him, He may see that it is necessary for us to search our hearts and repent of sin. Therefore, he takes us through test and trial. He brings us through humiliation, that we may see what hinders the working of his Holy Spirit through us. There are conditions to the fulfillment of God's promises, and prayer can never take the place of duty. If ye love me, Christ says, keep my commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. John 14, verses 15 and 21. Those who bring their petitions to God, claiming his promise while they do not comply with the conditions, insult Jehovah. They bring the name of Christ as their authority for the fulfillment of the promise, but they do not those things that would show faith in Christ and love for him. Many are forfeiting the condition of acceptance with the Father. We need to examine closely the deed of trust wherewith we approach God. If we are disobedient, 
we bring to the Lord a note to be cashed when we have not fulfilled the conditions that would make it payable to us. We present to God his promises and ask him to fulfill them when by so doing he would dishonor his own name. The promise is, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. John 15, 7. And John declares, Hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. 1 John 2, verses 3 through 5. One of Christ's last commands to his disciples was, Love one another as I have loved you. John 13, 34. Do we obey this command, or are we indulging sharp, unchristlike traits of character? If we have in any way grieved or wounded others, it is our duty to confess our fault and seek for reconciliation. This is an essential preparation that we may come before God in faith to ask His blessing. There is another matter too often neglected by those who seek the Lord in prayer. Have you been honest with God? By the prophet Malachi the Lord declares, Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Malachi 3, verses 7 and 8. As the giver of every blessing, God claims a certain portion of all we possess. This is his provision to sustain the preaching of the gospel. And by making this return to God, we are to show our appreciation of his gifts. But if we withhold from him that which is his own, how can we claim his blessing? If we are unfaithful stewards of earthly things, how can we expect him to entrust us with the things of heaven? It may be that here is the secret of unanswered prayer. But the Lord in his great mercy is ready to forgive. And he says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3, 10 through 12. So it is with every one of God's requirements. All his gifts are promised on condition of obedience. God has a heaven full of blessings for those who will cooperate with him. All who obey him may with confidence claim the fulfillment of his promises. But we must show a firm, undeviating trust in God. Often he delays to answer us in order to try our faith or test the genuineness of our desire. Having asked according to his word, we should believe his promise and press our petitions with a determination that will not be denied. God does not say, Ask once, and you shall receive. He bids us ask, unwearyingly persist in prayer. The persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he asks. Christ said to Martha at the grave of Lazarus, If thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. John 11, verse 40. But many have not a living faith. This is why they do not see more of the power of God. Their weakness is the result of their unbelief. They have more faith in their own working than in the working of God for them. They take themselves into their own keeping. They plan and devise, but pray little, and have little real trust in God. They think they have faith, but it is only the impulse of the moment. Failing to realize their own need or God's willingness to give, 
they do not persevere in keeping their requests before the Lord. Our prayers are to be as earnest and persistent as was the petition of the needy friend who asked for the loaves at midnight. The more earnestly and steadfastly we ask, the closer will be our spiritual union with Christ. We shall receive increased blessings because we have increased faith. Our part is to pray and believe. Watch unto prayer. Watch and cooperate with the prayer-hearing God. Bear in mind that we are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 Speak and act in harmony with your prayers. It will make an infinite difference with you whether trial shall prove your faith to be genuine or show that your prayers are only a form. When perplexities arise and difficulties confront you, look not for help to humanity. Trust all with God. The practice of telling our difficulties to others only makes us weak and brings no strength to them. It lays upon them the burden of our spiritual infirmities, which they cannot relieve. We seek the strength of erring, finite man when we might have the strength of the unerring, infinite God. You need not go to the ends of the earth for wisdom, for God is near. It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success. It is that which the Lord can do for you. We need to have far less confidence in what man can do and far more confidence in what God can do for every believing soul. He longs to have you reach after him by faith. He longs to have you expect great things from him. He longs to give you understanding in temporal as well as in spiritual matters. He can sharpen the intellect. He can give tact and skill. Put your talents into the work. Ask God for wisdom and it will be given you. Take the word of Christ as your assurance. Has he not invited you to come unto him? Never allow yourself to walk in a hopeless, discouraged way. If you do, you will lose much. By looking at appearances and complaining when difficulties and pressure come, you give evidence of a sickly and feebled faith. Talk and act as if your faith was invincible. The Lord is rich in resources. He owns the world. Look heavenward in faith. Look to him who has light and power and efficiency. There is in genuine faith a buoyancy, a steadfastness of principle, and a fixedness of purpose that neither time nor toil can weaken. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. There are many who long to help others, but they feel that they have no spiritual strength or light to impart. Let them present their petitions at the throne of grace. Plead for the Holy Spirit. God stands back of every promise he has made. With your Bible in your hands, say, I have done as thou hast said. I present thy promise. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. We must not only pray in Christ's name, but by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This explains what is meant when it is said that the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8.26 such prayer God delights to answer. When with earnestness and intensity we breathe a prayer in the name of Christ, there is in that very intensity a pledge from God that He is about to answer our prayer, exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 Christ has said, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Mark 11.24 Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14:13. And the beloved John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks with great plainness and assurance. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. 
John 5, 14 and 15. Then press your petition to the Father in the name of Jesus. God will honor that name. The rainbow round about the throne is an assurance that God is true, that in Him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. We have sinned against Him, and are undeserving of His favor, yet He Himself has put into our lips that most wonderful of pleas, Do not abhor us for Thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of Thy glory. Remember, break not Thy covenant with us. Jeremiah 14.21 When we come to Him confessing our unworthiness and sin, He has pledged Himself to give heed to our cry. The honor of His throne is staked for the fulfillment of His word unto us. Like Aaron, who symbolized Christ, our Savior bears the names of all His people on His heart in the holy place. Our great High Priest remembers all the words by which He has encouraged us to trust, He is ever mindful of His covenant. All who seek of Him shall find. All who knock will have the door open to them. The excuse will not be made, trouble me not, the door is closed, I do not wish to open it. Never will one be told, I cannot help you. Those who beg at midnight for loaves to feed the hungry souls will be successful. In the parable, He who asks bread for the stranger receives as many as he needeth. And in what measure will God impart to us that we may impart to others? According to the measure of the gift of Christ, Ephesians 4, 7. Angels are watching with intense interest to see how man is dealing with his fellow men. When they see one manifest Christ-like sympathy for the erring, They press to his side and bring to his remembrance words to speak that will be as the bread of life to the soul. So God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 Your testimony in its genuineness and reality he will make powerful in the power of the life to come. The word of the Lord will be in your mouth as truth and righteousness. Personal effort for others should be preceded by much secret prayer, for it requires great wisdom to understand the science of saving souls. Before communicating with men, commune with Christ. At the throne of heavenly grace, obtain a preparation for ministering to the people. Let your heart break for the longing it has for God, for the living God. The life of Christ has shown what humanity can do by being partaker of the divine nature. All that Christ received from God, we too may have. Then ask and receive. With the persevering faith of Jacob, with the unyielding persistence of Elijah, claim for yourself all that God has promised. Let the glorious conceptions of God possess your mind. Let your life be knit by hidden links to the life of Jesus. He who commanded the light to shine out of darkness is willing to shine in your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will take the things of God and show them unto you, conveying them as a living power into the obedient heart. Christ will lead you to the threshold of the infinite, you may behold the glory beyond the veil and reveal to men the sufficiency of him who ever liveth to make intercession for us.